wonderful process. Now, I want to think for a few minutes. We've got about 20. I want to think about the faithfulness of God. The whole concept of blessing and obedience. And I, I cracked that egg a little bit when I started talking about myself and, 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 and the obedience of following the Lord and saying, hey, I will. Okay. We did that for our salvation, right? And now that we're saved, now that we're saved, do we continue to do that? Do we continue to yield ourselves to his will and what he directs in his word? So that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. Turn for a second. The book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, it's a very well-known verse, but I want to read it with you, and I want to look at it a little bit differently this morning. First Corinthians chapter 1, and verse number 18, it says, For the word of the cross is folly. The word of the cross is folly. Now the word folly, in some of your translations it says what? Stupidity? What was the other one I heard over here? Foolishness. Foolishness. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is what? The power of God. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. We are looked at by the world as a bunch of nuts. The word of the cross, the gospel, God's word, which is contained in this book, is seen as stupidity, foolishness, folly. And when you think about it, you kind of get why. You mean you believe that the world was covered in water? Yeah. And that there was a boat that carried all the animals in the world? No, just, just two of each. Okay. Every single variety of animal got into this boat and ate people, and you believe this. Yep. And you believe in a talking donkey. Balaam. Remember that story? Well, yeah. I love that one. I love that one. So you believe that there was this big fish that came and swallowed up this guy, and three days later he was spit out on the land and he's still alive. Yeah. You believe in a little baby born to a virgin. Yeah. You believe that that little baby grew up to be a man that could walk on water. You believe that that man died on a cross and that because he died, your sins can be forgiven? Yeah. We do believe that. You're nuts. Because the word of the cross is what? Foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So yes, we believe that. And yes, we hold on to that. And that's the basis of our salvation, is our faith in that fact, right? How far are we willing to take it now? So if we say that the word of God 
is what made the gospel known to us and therefore we are saved through it. And, and we hold on to that, but the rest of the word of God is kind of goofy. The rest of the word of God is kind of outdated. It's not applicable to us. It's cultural. It's for those people. We kind of know better. Do you get where I'm going? I want you to give, give some examples. When the Bible talks about certain things, like the cross, and like our sin being forgiven through simple faith in Christ, we say amen. But when it talks about things like divorce and stuff like that, what's our first response typically? You remember when the Pharisees came and challenged Christ on that, okay? They said, so hold on. Is, is there any reason that a person can get divorced? And what was Christ's response? It's like, took them back to Genesis, didn't he? And he said, from the beginning, this is how it was. So therefore a man will leave and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And what God had joined together, let no man put asunder, right? And what was their response to that immediately? What did they do? They went for the loophole. But Moses, they went for the loophole. We do that a lot. And sometimes we don't realize that we do that. And I'm going to give you some more examples. Sometimes we don't realize that we do that. And it takes a conversation like this to bring it to light. Because sometimes when someone says, do you know that you all the time? You're like, no, I don't. No, I don't, right? Sometimes it takes someone pointing these things out for us to realize, oh, wait a minute. What does the word of God say about remarriage? And it seems like I'm picking on, but I'm not. We're going other places. What does it say about remarriage? We look for a loophole, don't we? What does it say about husband and wife relationships. Oh, you don't know my wife. Or, oh, you don't know my husband. When the word of God says, wives, honor your husbands, uh, but you don't know mine, um, do we believe it or not? And when the word of God says, husbands, love your wives, But what about the verse about living on the roof with a contentious... No, no, no. We're not looking for loopholes. But we do. When the Word of God talks about head coverings, what do we do? We look for the loopholes. Oh, well... What parts of the word of God are we willing to hold on to and frame our lives by versus the parts that we say, well, you know, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. But we have to recognize that we do it. Read through the book of Isaiah, right? The book of Isaiah is full of Israel Moving away from God, God coming in and judging and restoring, right? And the, the time and time and time again where God says, if you followed me, there's blessing. But you would not. So when it comes to the church, and God says there's to be order within the church, and it's supposed to be conducted a certain way, and there's supposed to be specific roles, and we say, well, we know better. Do we? The one who created us and hardwired us, the one who says, husbands, love your wives, but says to the women, 
women, wives, honor your husbands. Why did he give two different commands? Why did he give two different commands? Why didn't he say the same one for both? Women, love your husbands. Love conquers all. That's what the world tells us, isn't it? But he doesn't. He gives two very specific commands. Why? Because he knows that we're built differently. How does he know that we're built differently? He made us. He created us. He hardwired us to work in a certain way. Are we willing to follow him in what he says on how we should conduct our lives, or is that part foolishness like the rest of the world says? The only part that we hold on to is the truth of the cross. So when it comes to the church, and when it comes to church order and all those things, there's a famous verse in Matthew. Remember Peter and Matthew are talking, sorry, <laughs> I, I usually move around when I teach, and, and I, I, I can't move the microphone with me, so that's why I'm so... So, you remember that Peter, Peter and the Lord are talking, and the Lord says to him, who does, who does the world say I am? And so Peter said, well, they think that you're Elijah, they think that you're a prophet, they think you're a good teacher. What did Jesus do? He narrowed it down, he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? Matthew chapter 16 is where I'm, I'm going. And Jesus says, you're the Messiah. And what does he say? He says, flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And Peter, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I emphasize two key words in there for a reason. Whose church is it? Is it our church? We are part of the church. Whose church is it? It's the Lord's church. It's Christ's church. He's the one that paid the price for it in his own blood. It is my church. I will build it. So when he says to conduct yourselves a certain way, do we say, ah. What's the answer to it? Turn over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. I've taught on this years ago, and I'm going to bring it back because it's so critically important. And it's been such an encouraging, and, uh, an encouraging challenge to me in my own life. So I want to share it again, and, and for those of you who've already heard me teach on it, well, it was five, six years ago, and for those who haven't, hopefully this is helpful. First Peter chapter 5, Peter's writing to the church, and he's telling them how to conduct themselves within the church, and he begins by talking to the elders, and he says, elders, you are supposed to conduct yourselves in a certain way, and it's not about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, condense, it's not about a power trip. You're an example. But then beginning at verse number five, it says, likewise, you who are younger, um, those of us who are not elders, younger. Sorry, I'm holding on to that. I got gray hair now. You who are younger. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. But then here it is. Clothe yourselves, all of you. All of you. What does it mean to clothe yourself? Dress. Yeah. The word that's used here is literally take something that's not yours and put it on and tie it up. You put on a bathrobe, and you tie the belt at the center, and it holds it on, right? 
That's literally what it's talking about here. So when it talks about clothing yourself in humility towards one another, it's saying take something that's not otherwise yours and put it on and tie a knot. Man isn't generally a humble thing, is man or woman? We're not. We're proud. We're arrogant. We watch out for ourselves because the world says you have to, and we say, yeah, I'll buy that. But what's the word of the Lord telling us to do? Saying, no, 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 no. That's not who I called you to be. Clothe yourselves with humility, all of you. Take it, put it on, wear it. But then it tells you why. It says, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you notice that that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble is in quotation marks? Have you ever wondered why? It comes from the Old Testament. The word. And what does it say in the Old Testament about God opposing the proud? If you go back to Proverbs, you'll see it talks about the, seven, the six things that God hates, yea, seven he despises. Do any of you remember what the first one is that is listed there for the things that God despises? Sorry? Pride. Pride. It says a haughty heart. A prideful heart. God despises it. And read through the rest of that passage. It's fantastic when it talks about the things that God despises. But it's very, very important to understand. So if God opposes the proud, but, back to our passage, but gives grace to the humble, do we not want to be on that side? Do we not want to be in living in the grace of God? I mean, we're trusting on his grace for our salvation. We're trusting on it for our eternal security in our home that we will one day go to. But are we willing to live by what he says here and now in the rest of the book? So when he says that we are to be humble, we are to clothe ourselves with humility, and we are to live that way, do we say, well, Dan, that's actually... That's for those guys. We know better. Keep reading. Humble yourselves. Verse 6. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. What happens when we humble ourselves here and now? What does it say? I just read it. It says, if we humble ourselves at the appropriate time, who will exalt us? The Lord. Remember when... Jesus was teaching about when you go into a feast and you don't sit at the upper spot because someone might come and say, no, 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 that's not for you, move down. You sit at the lowest spot and then the master of the house comes and says, actually, I got a spot up here beside me. You see the difference, right? Wouldn't you rather be exalted by God for living humbly here? Definitely. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that at the proper time he may exalt you. Verse 7, casting all your anxieties or all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. We remembered this morning how much he cared for us. How much did he care for us? He sent his son to die on the cross for us. So that we could know our sins forgiven and live an eternal life with him in heaven. That's how much he loved us. He cares for us, therefore we can cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Be sober-minded, be watchful, verse 8. For your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Your adversary, the devil, 
It doesn't say the world's adversary, the devil. It doesn't say the sinner's adversary, the devil. It doesn't say those who believe or don't believe. He says your. It's personal. It's each one of us. Your adversary, the devil, is creeping around seeking whom he may devour. No, it doesn't say creeping, does it? It says like a roaring lion. He's making a lot of noise. He's letting you know that he's there and he's trying to terrify you. That's what it says. He's like a roaring lion. And he's trying to devour you. Can he devour you and take your life? No. Can he mess it up real nice for you while you're here? Yup. If you yield to him. So then what's the answer? Verse 9, resist him. Resist him. Bind him. No. No, it doesn't say that. Quote scriptures at him. No. He knows it better than you do. He's had a lot of time to learn it. Resist him firm in your faith. Other translations have what faith? Someone call it out. Resist him firm in what faith? What does it say? Steadfast faith. There's another, if you look at the King James, firm in the faith. Firm in the faith. Think about that for a second. How firm are you in your faith? Do you know the word? Better question. Do you understand the word? So many of us have set, well, I don't do anything until I spent an hour with the Lord in the morning. Well, that, that's great, fantastic, good for you. And so many of us others are like, Dan, I have to hit the ground running. There ain't no hour for nothing. I get that too. And so for some people, that particular thing works really well. And for others, it doesn't. But it's not about an hour or two hours a day or whatever. It's about the quality of the time that you do have in his presence, that you do have with, with his word. It's not about multiplying the word. It's about understanding the word. If you could change one thing in your life and take away, I need to do this for an hour, say, Lord, with the time that I have, help me to understand what you're saying. The Holy Spirit is there working within us to teach us what is being said. Do we rely on him? Or are we too busy just, well, I got to get this chapter done because, I, because I, I've committed to read the Bible in a year. That's fantastic. Do that. But how about if your approach is to learn it and understand it? And then once you've understood it, are we willing to apply it? Oh, see, now we're going back to what I was talking about at the beginning. Is the rest of what's contained in this book just foolishness to us, or do we set our lives by it? Time's gone. Mark chapter 3, don't turn there. Jesus is in a crowd of people. The Bible says it's a massive crowd perhaps as high as 10,000 people. And there's such a big group of them there, and he's teaching them, and he's healing them. And his family comes, and they can't even get to him. And it actually says he couldn't even so much as take bread. Okay, He hadn't even stopped for food. And his family comes. Who are the family? Well, his mother and brothers, it specifically says. They came and they sent a message through the crowd. Get the message up to him. It's time to come home. You need to rest. So the message works its way through the crowd and it comes to Jesus. And they said to him, Master, your family, your, your mother and your brothers are here. And they want to take you home. And what's Jesus' response to them? You said it. 
Who are my mother and brothers and sisters? That's right. Was, was he making a slight against his mother and brothers? No. But what he did is he took a teachable moment and he used it there in front of tens of thousands of people. And he said to them, because the rest of the verse says, but the ones who what? Who obey? I, I'm hearing it, but not. The will of God. That's right. Who listen and obey. So what is he saying? He's turned a conversation about your mom and your brothers are here, and he's turned it into, who are my mother and brothers but those who obey? Now, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called what? Children of God. Who are the children of God? Those who obey. It's a tough one. But remember it. This book is foolishness to the world. Yet we claim to hold on to it and follow it. So how well are we doing with that? Or do we just skip the parts that we think are foolish and don't really belong to us? It's those who follow and trust that are the brothers and sisters of Christ. Let's close. Our Father, we are so thankful for this time that we can open your word this morning and spend time reading it and understanding it, expanding upon it. Father, help each one who is here. Help us to follow your word, to read it, to understand it to apply it to our lives and to shape our lives around the truth that there is a God who indeed loves us, wants the best for us, and that there's tremendous blessing in obedience. Father, take these words, apply them to our hearts, please. We seek your blessing on each one that's here this morning. Bless our time together, we pray, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.